This is Ibarri and X, and this is The Candid Frame. I recently had the chance to serve as a judge to select a single photographer who would receive a significant endowment to further a personal photographic project. And with over 200 applications, there was no shortage of great photographs and photographers. As we reviewed the work of each applicant, I and the other judges would periodically voice our pleasure when we saw an image that we especially liked. But this contest was not judged on the quality of a single photograph. Instead, the award went to a photographer who had an idea for a project related to the aftermath of war and conflict. So for us, we had to believe that this person was not only a good photographer, but that they were capable of telling the story that they pitched in their proposal. And as I looked at each portfolio and proposal, I really appreciated the challenge it is for a photographer to successfully express an idea in photographs. It's ideas that inspire India Beale's photographs. Her examinations of race, sex, and body image are integral parts of her work. Some of her images can bring a smile to your face, while at the same time challenging you to reconsider what's acceptable and normal, especially in the workplace. One of her projects was inspired by stories of her college students who would share with her the challenges they faced while trying to land a job after graduation. Um, So I was teaching classes here and running the gallery and my students were coming to me not to talk about their academics or to talk about their classes. They wanted to talk about their interviews. Uh, Many of them were seniors uh, thinking about their careers and where they wanted to move forward. And they would say, you know, Professor Beal, uh, I've been using my name for all of my applications on my resume and I haven't received any callbacks. And my name is Sakia or my name is Alewa. Uh, Or, uh, you know, I I went to this interview and someone asked me uh, how many children I have. Or I went to this interview and someone asked me, um, you know, uh, do I normally wear my hair that way? Or I love it, your hair is so beautiful, where'd you buy that? You know, or I went to an interview and someone said, you know, you speak so well. I mean, can you tell me a little bit more about your education? Because I'm just I'm just so surprised. And I realized that my students were experiencing the same things that my mother experienced, that my grandmother experienced, that I experienced. But her own personal experiences also influenced her work when she discovered that unknown to her, The men in her office had been actively discussing her epically sized afro. She sought to challenge a dynamic that not only relegated her to being the other, but being the other without a voice. As an artist, I said, well, how can I be a part of that conversation? How can I join that dialogue? So I set two cameras uh, in the office, in the middle of the office, and I asked each man to participate in the art project. Now they knew I was a student at art, so they said, oh, this is, you know, she's a a graduate student in art. Uh, This is an art project. And I said, I want you to uh, touch my hair. And so they touched it and I said, I need you to touch it harder. And so they touched it a little harder and I was like, harder than that. And so they went a little harder than that. And then I came back uh, a week later and I was like, well, how was it? How did you like it? And you can tell in the voices of the men, the video is called office scene, but they're totally uncomfortable. I mean, thinking about that experience. (laughs) Right. No one said no. Everybody wanted to participate. But uh, the thing about it is, is that uh, the idea of the work was to make the comfortable uncomfortable. As a woman of color in that space, I was invisible, yet I was seen. Right. I was seen because they had a discussion about me, but I was I was voiceless. No one talked to me and had that conversation with me. We'll talk to India about the challenges of taking concepts and ideas and successfully communicating them in photographs and what important lessons she learned from her own bad photographs. Welcome to The Candid Frame. All right. Well, well, India, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. I was uh, was really fascinated when I when I saw the article on on your work. 
I have to tell you, it pushes a lot of buttons in me, you know, as I'm sure it does for a lot of a lot of people. But I thought it would be a really sort of a good conversation because I like going in deep when I can. And uh, I thought that this would be a, a real good point to, to do that with. You know, the project that came, to, uh, that came to my attention was the one, Am I What You Were Looking For?, which is a series of portraits that you do of young African-American women who are completing college and are about to enter the workforce. And you create these, these portraits of them in, in their homes but with the backdrop of a corporate office. Tell me about the whole inception for the idea and uh, what you were going for with these series of images. So I guess the the basis of the project stem from my own experiences uh, working within the corporate space. My students were coming to me. So I work at uh, HBCU. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many people don't know what an HBCU is. So we'll just go ahead and say it for everyone. A historically black college or university. And I I chose to be here. I really wanted to be here. When I was a student at Yale, a school of art, uh, in the photography MFA program, I was the only black person in my graduating, in my class. And it's one of the top photography programs in the nation, uh, in the world, possibly. And so thinking about network and opportunities, uh, going to a historically black college gave me the opportunity to leverage my network for my students. Um, So I was teaching classes here and running the gallery and my students were coming to me not to talk about their academics or to talk about their classes, they wanted to talk about their interviews. Uh, Many of them were seniors uh, thinking about their careers and where they wanted to move forward. And they would say, you know, Professor Beal, I've been using my name for all of my applications on my resume and I haven't received any callbacks. And my name is Sakia Mm -hmm. or my name is Alewa. Or, uh, you know, I I went to this interview and someone asked me uh, how many children I have. Or I went to this interview and someone asked me, do I normally wear my hair that way? Or I love it. Your hair is so beautiful. Where'd you buy that? Or I went to an interview and someone said, you know, you speak so well. I mean, can you just tell me a little bit more about your education? Because I'm just I'm just so surprised. And I realized that my students were experiencing the same things that my mother experienced, that my grandmother experienced, that I experienced going to this kind of idea of a corporate space, a world that was never designed for people of color or women um, at its foundation. Gordon Parks, famously, when he came to Washington to work for the Farm Security Administration, went to the, um, the director of the program, whose name escapes me at the moment. And he told him, okay, I want you to go out, have a lunch at a particular restaurant. I want you to go to a movie theater, so on and so forth. And Gordon was like, oh, okay. So he went out, tried to get a meal, and he couldn't be seated. He had to accept the meal through the back door. When he went to the movie theater, he was told that uh, he would have to go out through another entryway. You know, what you would expect during, during that time. And he came back, and he was angry about that. You know, the director told him, well... You know, how, 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 basically challenge him in terms of, well, how are you going to document that? How are you going to use the camera to, you know, express your anger and your disappointment at that? And that's where he made that famous portrait of that, of that African American woman, you know, with, with a broom in front of the American, American flag. And I thought about that, you know, that, that story when I was looking at your, your work, because that was what a lot of people would say was ages ago. You know, that, that whole the disparity of being treated differently and your images really sort of reflect the fact that uh, as much as things have changed and improved, there's some certain attitudes that persist. But, you know, the, the portraits that you're making are, are, are kind of in line with that whole idea of being able to express your disappointment and your students' disappointment in the form of a, of a portrait. But specifically, tell me about the choice to photograph them, especially using that particular backdrop in in the person's home space, as opposed to just maybe using a a simple seamless. And Uh, and definitely, I guess I'll begin with just the backdrop, uh, the image. So backdrop culture is very prevalent in the South. It's something that you see a lot, whether it's at clubs or or you go to, let's say you go to a party and there's a backdrop with some kind of graffiti on it and you're standing in front of it. Uh, so I was thinking about this kind of contemporary usage of backdrops and how it becomes a performance 
whether you're standing in front of it or not, you became, you're in a different space. And then thinking about other artists like James Van Der Zee and his beautiful portraits in the studio and that kind of idea that you were no longer in Harlem. Uh, you were some villa in Italy, you know, mm -hmm. and you were standing in front of his backdrop and you became a different person. You performed for that backdrop and you, you were able to escape whatever issues you were going through at that moment. Uh, I think that James Van Der Zee's photographs are instrumental and so important in kind of depicting and representing African-Americans in a way in which they wanted to be represented during that particular time. And so uh, I thought about other artists as well that were thinking about transition. So whether it's Renika Dykstra's uh, Beach series, where she's looking at the transitions um, uh, of youth and this idea of moving from one stage in your life to another, those transitions with either the bull, the bullfighters or I can think of a number of her portraits. And so putting that all together in my own experiences, I decided that I would use the, photo the photograph as a way to deal with the troubles that my students were experiencing. The office that they're standing in front of is the same office I worked in when I felt discriminated against, when I felt as though I was the elephant in the room, uh, that no one wanted to talk about the same hallway that I walked down every day. That's the one they're standing in front of. And I said, you know what? Let's do a project together. I'm going to go to your home, wherever that is. It doesn't matter. It could be in some little town in North Carolina no one's ever heard of or a bigger city. We're going to go there. Tell your mom I'm moving her furniture out the way. <laughs> and <laughs> we're going to bring a backdrop. The same hallway that I walk down every day, the same hallway that made me feel insecure and invisible and voiceless, that hallway, I want you to stand in front of that one. And I want you to wear whatever you deem professional. It doesn't matter. Whatever you think is professional, wear that. And I want you to pretend you walk in, it's your first day, and you're the only woman, and you're the only person of color in the room. How would you feel at that moment? And so thinking about this kind of historical documentation of James Van Der Zee's portraits, or even Renika Dykstra's transitions that she captured, these moments, this emotion that was in her photographs, that's in her photographs, I wanted to figure out a way to remix that idea and show that within my women in that series. You know, the dynamic that happens in the office, I think, is, can be a fairly subtle one, and maybe that's not the perfect word for it. You know, when people hear about people of color being treated differently because of their skin, they often think of overt racism, you know, being called names, being, being abused in a particular way. But uh, the reality is in today's culture that a lot of that dynamic is, let's say, less than obvious to people who aren't people of color. So when you describe your own experiences in the offices, give us some details into what that looked like and what that was like for you. So I guess my first experience started when I was working at uh, an IT as a graduate student at Yale University. I walked in and I realized that it was mostly men, mostly white men. And I'm tall. You can't tell, but I'm actually extremely tall. I'm like 5'10". It hasn't changed. Mm. And I normally have a very big afro, so don't let the sprinklers go off, right? You will <laughs> see the biggest afro you've ever seen in your entire life, okay? And it's huge. So you can imagine I'm like floating over the cubicles in this office space, and uh, a rumor started at my job that the men were very fascinated with my hair uh, so much that they wanted to know what it felt like. Now, you can imagine as a woman of, in that space, I felt kind of uncomfortable. Like, oh, my goodness, these men have never really talked to me, yet they're having this conversation about me. As an artist, I said, well, how can I be a part of that conversation? How can I join that dialogue? So I set two cameras in the office, in the middle of the office, and I asked each man to participate in the art project. Now, they knew I was a student at art, so they said, oh, this is, you know, she's a graduate student in art. Uh, this is an art project. And I said, I want you to touch my hair. And so they touched it, and I said, I need you to touch it harder. And so they touched it a little harder, and I was like, harder than that. And so they went a little harder than that. And then I came back a week later, and I was like, well, how was it? How did you like it? And you can tell in the voices of the men, the video is called Office Scene, but mm -hmm. they're totally uncomfortable. I mean, thinking oh, about you, that experience. you hear that. Yeah, <laughs> I listened to it this morning. <laughs> right, no one said no. Everybody wanted to participate. Mm -hmm. But uh, the thing about it is, is that uh, the idea of the work was to make the comfortable uncomfortable. As a woman of color in that space, I was invisible, yet I was seen, right? I was seen because they had a discussion about me. 
but I was I was voiceless. No one talked to me and had that conversation with me. So that's the difference is that you are seeing people know you're there, but they're not listening. Right. They have no reason to hear your voice. And so you are invisible. And so being in that space uh, and thinking about working with my colleagues, I'm a strong believer that if you make something together, it'll bring you together Mm -hmm. in a way that you've never imagined. And so afterwards, they definitely knew who I was (laughs) and and were more understanding of the project. And so, uh, so yeah, that's like, that's, I guess that's the initial start of the work. Yeah. Yeah. Did that, did that exercise that, you know, that artist project change the dynamic between you and the people in the office? Oh, well, we got closer. I guess some of them started running when they saw me. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, there's that girl. You know? <laughs> You know, but uh, we actually, with some of them, we end up getting closer. I mean, I, I explained to them what the project was about and really thinking about this idea of being the other in a space. And I think for many of them, they were trying to find a way to uh, to enter it. To So whether it's through their wife. So, oh, you know, my wife shares her experiences with me. I, I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But I think that idea of a conversation was taking place. Whether they could understand directly or not, there was a certain empathy that took place afterwards that was really interesting. And so now they share my work online and, you know, or follow me on Facebook. <laughs> it's a whole nother, it's a whole nother dynamic in itself. Yeah. One of the instructions that you gave the, the young women who you photographed was to tell them to just sort of dress the way, not just the way they would dress for an interview, but dress in a way that they preferred. Yes. Right? Which brings up the whole idea of having to create the persona that you walk into a space, especially a business space, especially as a person of color and a woman of color, which I thought was sort of an interesting aspect of how you collaborated with the girls. Talk to me about that, about basically putting on the costume, not not just, you know, your students that you photograph, but also yourself. It's a performance. I think you are your, when you're going to the job, you're your professional self, whatever that is. And I think for women of color in particular, there's a certain code of dress that is taught at a very young age. Uh, As my mother told me, when you go to your interview, you will straighten your hair. Uh, You will wear less makeup. You will no heels. Like you will mute yourself as much as possible in order to get that job. And I think that that's something that a lot of young women are taught in order to conform. And so when I asked the women to wear whatever they deem professional, it was the idea of breaking away from the conformity. What, how do you want to be perceived? What do you deem professional? What would you not wear or dare not wear in, uh, in an interview setting? Because you automatically know as soon as you walked in, you would be judged. Now, even for myself, I would go to interviews with Afros just to kind of see how I would be perceived, changing this kind of going against the advice I would say that my mother gave me. And I didn't get the job. Uh, as soon as I walked in, it didn't matter whether I went to Yale or Carolina or, you know, I was seen as militant and political and not fitting within the tribe that I was trying to uh, infiltrate in many ways. And so I think that for a lot of young women of color, it's an extra burden and thinking about, well, how am I going to look going into this space? Because I have to make sure that I'm not over the top. And so I think that giving those women the freedom to be themselves, their professional selves, whatever that is, took away some of the anxiety that can be associated with going to these interviews and trying to fit into these spaces. Mm -hmm. When you went to school, before you went to college, you know, elementary, junior high, did you go to schools that were predominantly mixed? Were they predominantly predominantly African-American? Uh, they were predominantly white. <laughs> white, okay. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> so, so you were were already sort of from very young became aware of the fact that how you dressed, how you spoke, how your hair was oh, no, going definitely. to be a consideration in terms of how you perceive how you oh, perceive. Definitely. I mean, I grow and I think that there's a lot of uh, other artists or individuals who have. Um, 
you know, uh, I'm pretty fair skin and the idea you sound white or, you know, all those things that can, um, that happen when you, when you are put in that space throughout childhood to, to high school, kind of molding your perception of what, of how you should view yourself and what is deemed appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, it transcends race, right? It's taught. And so I think for many women who decide to go against the grain, it's not just an easy decision, right? And you're going against everything that you've been taught in order to break away and free yourself from the conformities um, that have been placed on you. This idea of normalcy based on Western ideology. Yeah. The, the whole idea is sort of loaded. Man, that's not the right word. But I'll, I'll just try to explain it as best I, best I can. <laughs> this whole idea that as a young, as a young person, and I, I'm older than you, but I remember. Um, You're older than me, no. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, but I think in junior high it started for me because I was going to a school that was predominantly uh, African American Latino, and we started going to speech competitions in different parts of town, primarily in the Valley, in South Bay, and we would go to these schools that were predominantly white. And there I got to really discover for the first time that there was differences, not just in terms of race, but also in terms of facilities and in terms of how people sort of treat each other. And as I got older and then became, had friends on the west side of town in Beverly Hills and Malibu, I started to be more conscious of how I presented myself, how I dressed, mm-hmm. how I talked, you know, that whole cold code switching thing, you know, started there. Because whether someone had told me or not, I recognized that whenever someone saw me, it was always in contrast to a stereotype they, they likely had, whether it was verbalized or not. And part of the issue that I've had, you know, pretty much all of my life is that constantly having to think about it. Right. Regardless whether it's overt or not, regardless of whether someone is doing something, it's always a factor in my thinking whenever I'm choosing to interact with someone. And I've heard people say, well, it's it's your issue. Right. You know, because I don't see color. So you shouldn't act that way. You shouldn't think that way. But uh, as you as you mentioned, when you learn that that is a consideration that you have to make because of the way other people may or may not treat you, it's not so easy to just say, oh, I'm just going to stop thinking this way. Right. That's a little bit of a rant, I guess. But it's part of what I appreciate that I'm seeing in your work is that whole idea of the constant thinking that you have to, 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 to make about who you present yourself to be. Because mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's many people much, you know, much more adept at talking about issues of race and stuff is that the luxury of, of those who are white is that they never have to really think about race. And the burden of a system that is like this is that you have to constantly think about it as if you're basically always have to be at the ready to anticipate mm-hmm. those moments. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really at, at the heart of a lot of the work that that you're doing. Well, I don't have a question. I just like, <laughs> I just, just verbal diarrhea, but I'm just curious as to hear your reaction to that. No, I mean, I, I, I think that you're basically writing my artist statement right now. <laughs> 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 I mean, literally, and the thing about the work also that I wanted people to understand is that sometimes in art, because I consider myself an artist, uh, it feels like insider baseball, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're not in the game, then you have no idea what's going on. And I wanted to create work that spoke to the everyday experiences. Uh, You don't have to know about James Van Der Zee or Renika Dykstra or any artist for that matter. All you have to do is have a job and feel invisible one time at your job or had to change one time for your job and you understand. And it was something to me really beautiful about reaching outside of the gallery or outside of the kind of idea of what is considered 
quote unquote fine arts and create something that just spoke to the everyday people and allowed them to understand that their experiences could be viewed through the photograph, that their experiences could be shared through fine art, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of the photographic medium as art. So I, so I think that even here at, at the gallery, creating experiences that speak to the stories of my students and what they're going through, the contemporary stories that talk about what it means to be a woman, but also what it means to be a woman of color today. And I think that there are not that many stories being told that are addressing those issues. There's just not enough opportunities and platforms for people to have uh, to have access. So within the arts, and we can talk about that too. Is, is, is that reality a reflection of that the work is, isn't being created or that there aren't outlets for that work for people to discover it? I think that they're just not outlets. I definitely think the work is being created for sure, but it's about having a platform and having access to a network that gives you the opportunity to showcase those truths. Right. Uh, so I created some of the beginning of this project started at the Center for Photography at Woodstock, uh, which is located in Woodstock, New York. I tell people the hippies are still there. They mm. had babies and you know, <laughs> open shops. <laughs> it's very much that, you know. But the Center for Photography at Woodstock is designed for artists of color. It is one of the rare photographic residencies in the United States that is created for artists of color, giving them a platform to have a voice. And so I'm following a line of amazing photographers like Deanna Lawson or Latoya B. Frazier or Daoud Bey, uh, who have had either attended the residency or worked with that residency uh, in some way. And so they gave me the time and the space to build the work, to create the work, and to do the research that was necessary in, in pulling it forward. And I think that those platforms like CPW or the Studio Museum in Harlem, I mean, there's so many that are giving artists platforms to to really infiltrate this network we call art that was never designed for artists of color as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of this, you know, a lot of overlap. We can think of either the corporate space or even the fine art space or photojournalism for that matter. By the time that you hear this, I will have just returned from the Miami Street Photography Festival. I attended it last year, and it was an amazing experience, bringing me in, into contact with some great photographers. But one of the best parts of last year, and hopefully this year, was meeting many of you face to face. It was such a pleasure to meet people who have been listening to me talk for years and who really love the work that we're doing. Seeing somebody face to face and learning how this show and the work that we do has impacted their lives is nothing short of amazing for me. It's important for me to hear that because there are some days when checking off all the things on my to-do list is a real challenge. But time after time, I've heard from you how this show is making a difference. You see it as something more than just a diversion from a long commute to work. And I want to keep doing it and doing it well. And to achieve that, I need your help as we work towards our goal of 100 new Patreon supporters, each of whom commit to a recurring donation of $5 or more a month. $5 may not seem like much, but when it's part of a community who wants to support what the Candid Frame is and does, it's invaluable. If this show is helping you, encouraging you, inspiring you, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter today. Your modest donation can and will make a huge difference. So if you haven't already, please take the time to do it today. Thanks.
I um, attended a writer's workshop, which was primarily based in San Francisco, but it's expanded beyond that. It's called VONA, Voices of Our Nation. And it was uh, basically a writer's creative writing conference and some nonfiction that was organized for writers and poets of, of color. And I remember that one of the, the comments that I heard over and over and over again by all the people who were attended there was this idea of being in a space where you didn't have to ex- explain yourself, you know, where you could just produce work and people got it, not just because they were ex- from the same experience, but it was you weren't burdened by having to not only explain the work, but justify it. <laughs> and and that sounds like that Woodstock experience was very much like that. But tell me about your own experiences with that whole issue of having to sort of explain yourself, explain your work and having to justify it. You know, a colleague of mine said something that was really profound. She said that we're all educated in the United States, per se, in a kind of Western education. And so if you all receive this Western education, she said that India, the majority of your audience is white, right? We're not talking about white in terms of race, but in Mm -hmm. in terms of ideology and mindset. And so going to a school like Yale, in having to give these kind of critiques and have the conversation, it was important for me to create work that my audience could understand. Because I could be talking and talking, but if you don't get what I'm saying, then what difference does it make? And so for me, it was the challenge of making work that I didn't have to over explain, right? I, I call it simply complex. You know, thinking about specific issues. I tell my students here at the university that we can talk about things in general, right? But really, the beauty and meat of work comes in taking a risk to talk about something that's personal and specific. And so I think that when I took that risk to talk about my own insecurities, uh, whether it be in corporate spaces or whether it be in my own fine art practice, it allowed me to have access to people and understand, I guess, access in a way of understanding, understanding the work and, and really getting it. So I think being in spaces where you're the only one can be uncomfortable, but it's also challenging because it forces you to address who your audience is, right? And creating some type of empathy that can uh, create understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Your, the, the work, this work, and another one that I'm going to talk about, the idea comes out really effectively and very strong. But... Um, we're dealing with a medium that is primarily visual for the, for the most part. And conveying an idea in photographs is a real challenge. It's a skill unto itself. So, and it doesn't come easily. So I want to hear about a time where you were learning it and struggled with being able to bridge that gap between what you were thinking and what you were feeling and the images that you were actually creating? Was there a a particular project or an experience that really allowed it to sort of click in terms of you being able to communicate those, you know, those ideas and photographs? No, definitely. I made a lot of bad work. (laughs) (laughs) I tell tell my students, I started this project in 2012, you know, they get assignments and they're working in them for like a semester. I'm like, listen, I started this in 2012. And at the time I knew I was feeling something, but I didn't really know how to explain it. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of trial and error, just trying to figure out how to, and sometimes it's just talking it out, how to talk out the issue that you're trying to address and shooting a lot of really bad photographs. <laughs> and then uh, eventually it just kind of clicks. I think that having a community of supporters and mentors is imperative. The wonderful thing about my Yale experience is that you have an opportunity to get advice from the best. Uh, whether it's Gregory Crutzen or Collier Shore or Lorna Simpson or Carrie Mae Weems or Mark Bradford, 
right? I know one time Mark Bradford, do you, are you familiar with Mark Bradford? No, I, I'm probably seeing his work. He, you know, he's, he's LA based. So you definitely should check him out. He's a painter. Uh, and he, he did a critique of my work and I'm a hip hop head. Mm-hmm. And so I told him that and he was like, well, I mean, you know, you want to be like Nas, right? Like you want to be like Nas Illmatic. You don't want to be like a one hit wonder, do you? And I was like, no, I'm trying to be like Nas. And so the idea, <laughs> the idea is that you have to kind of figure out where that, where the voice, where your voice is. Uh, Latoya B. Frazier said to me, she said, India, the history of women of color in photography is still being written. You have to ask yourself, where are you going to fit in that history? Where are you going to be in that history book? And that, that is important. But you have to know the history to know where you're going to fit in. And so for me, uh, it was a challenge having their field to force you to step outside of your comfort zone and take a risk. Okay. I'm going to press you a little more on these bad <laughs> photographs because, you know, people th- typically think of bad photographs and go, oh, they're out of focus, they're fully <laughs> exposed. We're talking about something else completely. So give me a little more in terms of what what was bad about these photographs. <laughs> A bad photograph. Okay, so when I first started the series of Am I What You're Looking For, I started photographing. So remember, I was talking about backdrop culture and that especially in the South, it's like at the club and people are like, you know, we'll say, quote, unquote, performing at certain places. So I took the backdrop first. I took the backdrop to the club. And I was thinking, hmm, this may be interesting. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I have this office scene that I work in and I felt like a, like a spectacle, right? And so I said, what do you take the photo, the, the actual backdrop to this kind of spectacle club-like setting? So I took it to the club and I recruited women who were there. A lot of them were scantily clad, right? And I had them stand in front of the backdrop and, uh, and take pictures. And... They did that, and I realized that it was a one-liner, right? There was nothing interesting about it. Uh, Some may look at those photographs and think that they are, that they they do a lot. But for me, it just didn't do anything. If anything, it just reinforced certain ideas about African-American women. It just reinforced certain stereotypes that I wasn't necessarily heading in that direction. So So I say that, I would say that to say... I realized it was deeper. The issues that I, were, I was talking about weren't just about my physical appearance. It was more about the kind of mental exhaustion of being in the space and having to perform. And no matter how much you performed, no matter how much you changed, no matter how much you altered yourself, you were still othered. No matter how much you tried to fit in. So I think that photographing in the club, it became about the physical kind of hypersexualized idea of black women. But I realized it's more than just sex or sexuality. It was more it was it was a lot of other internal issues that I felt like the work needed to address. So I say bad photographs in the sense that if someone saw them, they might think they were interesting, but I wanted it to, to have more substance. Yeah. It's in, yeah. In, in the fine art world, the artist statement is always sort of a critical component of what the what the artist sort of intends with it but i think to some degree the work most people most most average people don't really consider artist statements they just kind of look at the look at the photographs so you know that artist statement is more for like i guess curators <laughs> Than, than any than anyone else. So it was part of your sort of learning process was discovering how to aptly communicate your feelings, your ideas, your concepts in the photographs and not so much relying on, on the word? Uh, definitely. So I think the idea of conceptual artwork was really being able to talk about your work, but you want to make sure that what you're saying is reflective in the photograph Mm -hmm. or the painting or the sculpture. And so I think that's why a lot of people go to grad school to make sure that what they're saying and their ideas are shaped. That's one reason are shaped. They they, they go parallel. They're the same. So I would say that's always a challenge. I think for any artist to make sure, because you may have the idea first, but you want to make sure you don't have to, explain it or over explain it yeah. that it speaks for itself or at least has enough ambiguity where people can use their imaginations and create conclusions a, a predecessor to the, the work we've talked about already was uh, can i touch it in which you uh photographed uh white women who were adorned in what is typically associated with black hair cornrows braids twisties all that Stop. Twisties. <laughs> what is twisties? <laughs> That's my word. Hey, look, I got a bald head. I got. I ain't, I had an afro years ago. Beyond that, I have no idea. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a high five. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but tell me about, about that project. So after I did the, the office scene video, I, um, I decided I was going to do some work with my white female colleagues. Mm-hmm. So as women uh, can be, they're more forthcoming with their comments. And they would say things like, girl, how's your hair do there? How long did that take? Or can I touch it? Or they just touch it, you know, and they're like all in your head. And you're like, wow, you're like, I'm at, the, I'm at the office. Like, you're really in my personal space. And so uh, I decided to do a series of works with the women that I was working with. So when they asked me about my hair, I said, you know what? Why don't you let me give you this look? I can do that for you. <laughs> and they're like, really? I'm like, yes. However, if I give you this look, you have to let me take a corporate portrait of you. And they said, well, why a corporate portrait? And I said, because we're going to question conformity. And I explained to them that if I went to an interview with finger waves, scrunches, and a bun in the back, right, they would consider me to be ghetto or, or, or some other uh, stereotype. And so what happens if we question conformity and I give you this look and I make you the other for a moment? And so it's about hair, but it's also about conformity and having to change in that space. And so the ladies allowed me to give them the hairstyle that they couldn't pick the hairstyle. I picked it okay. and they had no time to process it. Like after they got their hair done, you taking a picture. And the only requirement was that they wore a white shirt and a black jacket or something. And so it's interesting because people ask me, well, did the women like the hairstyles? Hell no, they didn't like those hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine. They were like, oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> it was terrible. But uh, I didn't care. I could care less whether they liked it or not. It wasn't about liking a hairstyle. It was about talking about something greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, that was the most important thing. So they sat down, they took the picture and we talked about it. You know, at the time, I assumed that these white women had no idea what I was talking about when I explained the idea of having to conform in those spaces. I I was wrong. Uh, Not only did the women understand, they had their own stories, uh, their own testimonies about those experiences. And so in sharing their stories, I realized that even as women, there was a level of conformity that they themselves had to endure uh, within these spaces. And so they understood exactly what I was talking about and why the work was important. And so I tell people these white ladies allowed me to make them the other only for a moment to create greater empathy around the idea of conformity or this idea of diversity and inclusion which is a hot topic uh, as of today. And did it open your eyes just a little bit in terms of that you're not the only one who feels alone? I mean, you may be the only black woman in, in that group, but as far as the other women are concerned as well, that in their, each in their own way, regardless of race, can feel that sense of isolation. Um, one of the videos that you did was a series of interviews with women, including your mother, about their yeah, experiences in the corporate world. You mentioned <laughs> your mother you know earlier. My mama. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute now. No one knows it's my mama. How did you know it's my mother? She looks like a clone of you. Huh? She looks like a clone of you. Oh. <laughs> oh, you guys look exactly alike. <laughs> Yeah, she's like talking about her stockings and stuff. It's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, you were talking to women that were not just of your generation or you're younger. You were talking to a pretty good spread in terms of age and experience. Tell me about uh, about exploring that subject with with the women that you chose and and doing it in video as opposed to doing it in stills and saying, doing an interview and printing out the responses to your questions. So early I was talking about my mother's advice in regards to how I should look going to interviews. Now you have to understand my mother is seasoned in experience. So she knew exactly what she was saying because she had gone through that. And as most mothers, they're trying to protect their daughters and give them the guidance to make the same mistakes they didn't make. So with the nine to five, I think lots of times uh, as women, we are, for myself, I can only speak on my own experiences. My mother comes from 12 siblings. Right? 12. And it was nine, nine girls, right? So I have a lot of aunts <laughs> and all of them uh, shaped my perspective, but they all guided me 
and being a woman. And I think as women, specifically women of color, you hear these stories growing up kind of guiding you and telling you don't do that or don't talk to him or, you know, <laughs> all the things that as women, uh, that kind of knowledge you can receive. And so in creating the nine to five video, now nine to five is one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, you know, it's Dolly Parton, it's Jane Fonda, there's a theme song, we can sing it together if you'd like. And, <laughs> and uh, but I realized that I couldn't think of a single film that spoke to the everyday experiences of black women. So nine to five is de dealing with white women at their job or working girl with Melanie Griffin is dealing with a white woman at her job or even Alfred Hitchcock's Marnie is all dealing with white women and, the, and their experiences. And so when you think about Hitchcock or, or working girl or nine to five, I was thinking, well, where's the story of women of color? Where's the story of black women and their everyday experiences? And so uh, I, I asked that these women to tell me stories, many I've heard before, but never recorded. And some of the women I didn't know, uh, some of the women I knew personally, I wanted women who were seasoned in their experiences. Unlike the women in Am I What You're Looking For, uh, these black women are directors executives, they've overcome a lot of adversity in their life. And so I wanted to talk about that history, that knowledge that's given and passed down that guides you. And so I interviewed over 10 women. Together, it would be a 90 minute documentary if we wanted to, a really good documentary, but 90 <laughs> minutes nonetheless. And uh, I asked them to tell me a story. Tell me about an experience where you dealt with racism or prejudice because you were a woman or because you were black. And how did you deal with that? And the stories blew my mind. And after I did all the stories, I didn't know what I was going to do with that information and all those interviews. And then I realized that the stories were all the same. It was the same story. Mm -hmm. I mean, just different places, whether it was banking or healthcare, education, it didn't matter. They were telling the same stories. And so putting them together... Uh, like they were in the same room, like they were finishing each other's sentences was pretty easy. It was organic because in many ways, these women were, they were finishing each other's sentences. Yeah. One of the things that really um, touched me to my core was when they were talking about their anger and not expressing it and having to sort of temper that down because of the stereotype of the angry black woman, that if they did express their anger, for what was being said or was being, you know, for some behavior that they would be contributing to that stereotype, even if they were completely justified in their anger. And it's just like uh, having to stifle that part, even though, you know, you know that it's probably the, the best choice to make. Nevertheless, that is frustrating is not the right word. You know, it doesn't really sort of capture having to do that, not just once, but over over a lifetime, especially in a professional career. I, I guess I want to ask you, not that it did it surprise you, because I, I, I doubt that it, it, it did, but did hearing that aspect of it over and over again make you reconsider it in any, in any particular way other than just sort of reaffirming that it is a common experience? I think it just reaffirmed that it was a common experience. When I was creating the video, I was trying to figure out how to edit it together so that the message was clear. And I like to use humor in my work. I think adding an element of humor, I call it my Richard Pryor effect. You, okay. know? <laughs> you know, talking about something that's kind of actually serious, but if I can make you laugh a little bit, it may be easier to digest. And using the humor and adding those kind of other elements, it doesn't necessarily take away from the seriousness of what they're talking about. But I think for the everyday viewer, it gives them an opportunity to, to actually listen, right? And, and understand without, without adding the anger, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that's your first, your first instinct is to be upset. But I say, you know, I'm not upset, right? I'm trying to figure out a way for you to understand the human experience. And so I, I, I just so happen to be black and I just so happen to be a woman. And I just so happen to talk about both of those experiences, but I'm also a human being. And so I want you to understand these experiences from these women from a human perspective. And I think that was one of the reasons why I added the humor into it, just so people could, so it could really, it will, it will remove certain barriers mm -hmm. and, uh, and give people access to it in a way, especially if I'm talking to a group that 
these stories are foreign to them. What's been the most gratifying experience that you've had in terms of the reaction to to your works so thus far? Uh, you know, I think I when I give a lot of talks, artist talks, and I would say 85% of the time when I give these talks, somebody is like crying uh, in the audience and like comes up to me crying. And that kind of emotion that you that someone can feel from like the work you're making, I don't know, you just, you can't ever imagine that would happen, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that uh, this kind of, when people say, I see myself in the work or I felt this yesterday or I, did, I came in here and I had no idea what it was going to be about. I had no idea that it was going to touch me the way it did. Like that kind of um, feedback, just, I don't know, it, 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 uh, it pushes you forward, right? I think as artists and makers, sometimes we need to, we need to, um, what's the word? It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> the words are leaving. <laughs> But you understand what I'm yeah, saying. I, I mean, you know, it's just it's a kind of I mean, you can't explain it. You know, I don't I don't think when we make work that that's the kind of reaction we're looking for. And, you know, we just I tell I tell my students that I don't make work to please. Right. I'm making it because it's important and it needs to be in the world. And so uh, whatever feedback, good or bad feedback is is going to create a conversation uh, both series, any, actually all the series, Am I What You're Looking For, uh, Can I Touch It, Office Scene, 9 to 5, none of these answer the questions, right? They pose questions. What if? What if Ellen walked into your room or your office and she had her hair in, what do you call them, twists? <laughs> <laughs> and twists, what, what you know? do you call them? What's, what's the word for them? I, I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm messing. <laughs> well, what are they called? What do you just call them? or you know or cornrows you know or what if taekwon if his resume was right in front of you you know uh the questions like i said it poses a question what if it forces the viewer to 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 check your own biases because we all have we all have them it -hmm. transcends race right and the work may not change your perspective but when you bypass tyrone tyrone's or sakia or alewa or Zakia, whoever, if you bypass their application because of their name, you will know why, right? You won't sit there and say, well, I was naive to it. Mm-hmm. You know, I understood exactly what I was doing and why I did it. And so, uh, so I think that's it. It forces you to have that conversation, good or bad. Mm. Well, my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Only one? Only I one. have like a laundry list of people. Everybody I can does, but you only got one. I mean, you, but see, you already know the work of like Latoya, right? She's, you know. Well, you this, know is my, this is my list. my listeners. I got listeners all over the world, so. Oh, okay, okay. Well, they already know. I mean, she just wanted Mac Arthur. If you don't know Latoya B. Frazier, then I mean, get up. What <laughs> rock were you living under? <laughs> get from under the rock, you know? Uh, so, you know, so we were just going to say, I just said that just to make sure, but um, who else? Uh, so the two, I'm sorry, I have to say two. Okay. You know, we, as artists, we set our own rules, right? You know? <laughs> uh, so uh, there's Eli Reed. Eli, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's just... I um, had an opportunity to meet him when I came out to L.A. Actually, I was in San Francisco uh, with Geek Fest, which is kind of a, uh, it was in Oakland. Geek Fest was created by Melissa Little. And Geek Fest is really much, it's, it is what it is, photographers geeking out about photography, right? And uh, we all come together and we share stories and opportunities. And us a lot of young emerging photographers, but also a lot of prof- like Eli who've been in the game forever. And it just gives the opportunity to connect with one another and to build from one another and get inspired and connected. So I would say that if you don't know Eli Reed, then... Again, what rock are you living under? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, another uh, photographer is John H. White. John. John H. White. I recently was at Eddie Adams, and I ended up having um, hearing a talk by um, Mr. White. And when I say I was crying in the audience, just like bawling, <laughs> it was the most uh, inspirational. Um, inspirational is not even a good word. 
just beautiful presentation of life and photography and passion and pain that I had ever seen in my entire life. And uh, I think those two men have touched me as far as just, not just photography, but just personally in a way that I can't describe. So yes, Eli Reed and John H. White, uh, if you don't know them for the listeners, right? Two. Uh, and, and then LaToya, if you don't know, you know, uh, LaToya B. Frazier, then uh, definitely. Great, re- great recommendations. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with oh, you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to India for coming on the show. You can find out more about her and her work by visiting IndiaBeal.com. And my follow-up to my first book, Chasing the Light, is now available for purchase. It's called Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow. If you feel stuck or are struggling with making good photographs consistently, this book is for you. It goes beyond the correct settings on your camera and really helps you to see with a critical and creative eye. You can order the book today, and when you place your order from the Rocky Nook website, use the promo code PORELLO40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check it out on the website or the show notes for the link. And once you read it, please write a review as it helps me to spread the word. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you're hearing here on the show, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store as it helps our ranking and just creates great awareness of the show. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, and you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. And if you easily want to access every episode of The Candid Frame, download the free Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android. The Candor Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at Ibarian X. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.